Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Down below, you can find out how to become a member of the channel or buy me a coffee if you are enjoying what you are hearing. To those of you who are new to the channel and you are enjoying what you're hearing or you've been here already and haven't done so, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help support this channel, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Terrifying Cave Stories. Right after this intro, an ad will play. I'll read the first story an ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. I was hiking the hot route between Chamonix and Zermatt back in 2015. And myself and another hiking buddy had set up our tent after a big day and we were exploring the rocky landscape around the hut. There was a big concrete opening, like a warehouse cut into the rock that caught my eye, and we grabbed our head torches and walked in. At the end of the chamber was a large tunnel that sloped down into the mountain, just wide enough for a car, but with small streams running down the sides and our voices echoing down forever. We kept walking into the blackness for a few hundred meters until we heard a faint engine sound and pinpoints of light. Suddenly, dawning on us that a vehicle was approaching, we found a side tunnel and hid while the vehicle passed. This side tunnel was even more creepy and had old cans and rubbish lying around from the 60s, it seemed. As we wanted to avoid being caught in the road tunnel again, we just kept going along this passage. As unlikely as it seemed, we saw faint moonlight ahead and had to squeeze through a gap in the concrete to take us outside on the side of the mountain where there was a thin path back to the track. Such a fun experience. All right, dear listeners, I'm going to go ahead and say as I'm narrating these stories, I'm really claustrophobic, so <laughs> hopefully I can make it through the whole video. I don't know about you all, but there's just something about caves that are fascinating yet scary as hell. Let's get back to this vocal melatonin now. I work as a child care professional, and one of the kids that I look after had recently gotten into hiking. I decided to take him to a really cool trail in Salt Fork State Park. We were all set to hike to Hosack's Cave after parking right near the beginning of the trailhead. The entire trail is about a half of a mile, which is why I chose this trail for our hike that day. I also chose this trail because any time that I had been on it before, it was very busy and full of people in a very popular spot which made me feel secure. However, this past summer, we had a cluster of severe summer storms, which caused massive damage to the trail. So to my surprise, it was much more difficult and completely empty. I wasn't bothered by the trail being obviously empty because there was a small construction crew working on a bridge that was just barely visible from the trailhead. He was still up for the hike, despite the entire width of the trail being washed out until it was no more than a foot wide with a six to 12 foot drop off into a creek bed that is solid rock and several trees down. He is very athletic and I was confident in his abilities if he was, and he was so excited to tackle our adventure. We made it all the way to a platform that allows you to see the entire cave. There were many down trees surrounding the platform, and it was actually closed to this point, but we hadn't made it this far, so we decided to maneuver around the platform and proceed at the few hundred feet into the cave. We spent the most time in this area due to the difficulty, so I know exactly what it looked like. There were tree roots directly under the platform, and you could climb down either side of them. 
It is also worth noting that Hosak's cave is much more like a cliff with an overhanging rock formation and a trickle of waterfall directly in the middle. It is not a creepy closed up cave. It is very open and beautiful. We got to the cave and I noticed a candle that was not burning recently, but had been at some point sitting on a large rock that had a heart carved into it. I chalked it up to someone having a date or something and disregarded it. He wanted to climb to the top where I noticed two more candles and three stacks of small rocks that had been stacked up by somebody. I definitely felt weird at this point, but it was about this time that he found a small puddle full of baby salamanders and wanted to catch them. It was the happiest that I had seen him in a very long time, and I didn't have the heart to tell him that it was time to go. We spent about an hour catching baby salamanders, and I watched him have the time of his life. We finally decided to leave, and when we got to the platform, dead center in the middle of the tree roots was a wet washcloth hanging that was absolutely not there before. He noticed it as well, but did not pick up on the severity of the situation that we just found ourselves in. At that moment, I factually knew two things. One, someone was watching us and we did not see them. And two, they were now potentially hiding in the woods and made it a point to not be seen, but to leave an object to be noticed. There was no running back with the narrow trail, and I was not about to tell him that we were in potential danger. I told him to go in front of me, and I just kept encouraging him that he was doing great over and over, and that seemed to speed him up naturally. I never saw anyone while we were on the trail. We got to the car and I locked the doors immediately. On our way out of the park, a very dirty man, probably in his 30s, came out of the woods and made it to a point to stare at me with the most empty of expressions that I have ever seen. The man followed me with his eyes and head as I drove by him and continued to stare at me until I couldn't see him anymore. I knew the third fact at that point. He made it to a point to make himself apparent to me, and that facts one and two were true. That stare stuck with me for days, and I considered counseling after this as it bothered me for several weeks, causing severe anxiety. I tried to tell myself that maybe we just interrupted his bath time, and he was camping and didn't want to startle us. After all, the crazy-looking man had ample time to do anything that he wanted while we were catching salamanders. I just cannot in any way rationalize why he stared into my eyes the way he did, if he wanted to go unnoticed. Deep down, I know that it is much more likely that it was a deliberate action intended to scare me. He never had any idea how panicked I was. And to this day, it is the most fun that I have ever seen him have. He brings it up regularly, and it was a very positive experience for him. It was one of my worst experiences, however, and it made me feel so sick and disturbed. I never made any more plans to return to that cave. This happened during a tour of the Edinburgh catacombs. I think the actual term is bolts, but our tour guide just called them the catacombs, so I will too. I'll start off by saying I was studying abroad in England back in the fall of 2017, and my friends and I went to Edinburgh for a weekend trip just to explore and sightsee. One of my friends looked online and we found out that, one, Edinburgh was very haunted, and two, they had ghost tours. So we picked one that was the cheapest. We were on a college budget. It started off pretty chill. The tour was super nice and friendly. Walked around above ground, saw where the longest hanging took place in Edinburgh, and other haunted places. 
But then we learned that there were catacombs, or vaults, in certain places, and the tour would take us into one. I never knew Edinburgh had catacombs or vaults, so I was shook but excited. I can't remember the exact place where we went to. Sorry, fuzzy memory. But we climbed down these steps and into a giant, almost cavern looking place. It was very dark with some lanterns, creepy as hell environment, and our tour guide explained how people have seen different ghosts and how most are friendly, but one is like extremely mean and terrible. She said people have actually screamed and ran out of there. None of that happened to me or friends in this tour, but the entire time we were down there, I remember the back of my neck getting really cold, like winter level of cold. And when we went to the part where people saw the particularly mean spirit or specter, I felt like I needed to get out, like very bad vibes. I don't know the exact wording, but it felt very ominous. I didn't though, and just stayed in the middle of the group and took deep breaths. And eventually, we left and I felt better. When we got out, we talked about the experience. One of my friends, Nick, who was on the far edge of the group against the wall, felt worse than me. He felt his entire body get cold and started shivering. He said at one point, he felt someone grab his hand in the room where people saw the evil specter and thought he heard whispering. We were the only two to actually get affected during the ghost tour among all of our friends. I'm bored during quarantine and thought I'd share this experience. It's literally stayed with me this entire time. One of the creepiest experiences ever. If you happen to find yourself there for a tour, don't say I didn't warn you. I'm writing this story to see what you all think. Me and my friends are still unsure to this day. I went to college in Moorhead, Kentucky, and this was back in 2017, I think. There are these old mining caves called the Mushroom Mines, and they aren't in use anymore, but it is a hot spot for spooks and exploring. People always say crazy stuff goes on down there, like rituals, etc. But I only believe the occasional drug deal or something. Someone said police found a goat cut in half down the center of its face there, but I never saw evidence of that, so I don't believe any of that even to this day. Me and my friend Teddy and my boyfriend at the time decided to go to the caves at around 2 or 3 p.m. one afternoon after class. I can't remember who, but I think we had one or two other friends with us. Maybe Teddy's friend because I honestly can't remember. When we got there, there was another car parked outside the caves and it seemed like it didn't belong to anyone. Crazy. It was a lime green little thing, clean as what we could see with the windows rolled down. Maybe because it was hot as hell outside at that time. No one was around that we could see though. That wasn't really weird because there are a lot of hiking trails next to the cave and no one was in the mouth of the cave, so we assume they must be hiking. So we are exploring the mouth of the cave and only going maybe 10 to 20 feet deep because if you've been to a mine or deep cave before that isn't in use anymore, you know it is pitch freaking black and cold. We did have flashlights, but they weren't that bright. We weren't going a mile or anything, so it didn't matter. All of a sudden, Teddy just asks, Did you guys see that? This immediately sent chills down my spine, and I think he's just trying to scare us. My boyfriend goes to where he's standing and asks what he saw. As Teddy is explaining what he thinks he saw, a small light come on down the cave, way deeper down. A small light clicks on way, way, way farther than we are down the cave, as if reacting to his acknowledgement. It was a light from a flashlight. It clicks back off and we take a second, and then we get the hell out of there. 
So guys, I don't know what to think of this at all. They didn't have their light on when we first showed up, so they were, what, just hanging out down there in the dark? They didn't say hi to us or speak to us at all. And it's weird that it seems like they almost tried to get one of our attention instead of, again, just calling out and greeting us all. They also have no idea we were coming or that anyone would be coming. We had all skipped our afternoon classes, so most students wouldn't even maybe be there until five or six to explore. Please tell me what you all think. I haven't gone back since. Obviously, I don't think it was a monster or ghost or anything, but if anything, people freak me out more, especially ones who hang out in old mines alone with no light. The state of New York is filled with paranormal activity, from Alcatraz Island to the Amityville Horror House, the Fox Sisters' home, and the Landmark Theater. But in my small town, just outside of Syracuse, we have Whiskey Hollow Road. This incredibly narrow road has no light and stretches for five miles. On one side of your vehicle is a seemingly endless, tall hill covered in trees and on the other side is a 30-foot drop into a ravine. So basically, if you have to make a three-point turn on the street, you'd better be a professional stunt driver. The story goes like this. Back in the 50s, a married couple lived in a small shack on one end of the road. They were a seemingly normal couple, though some speculated domestic issues and possible infidelity. One day, the husband came home to find his wife's body collapsed on the floor of their home, covered in blood, and his shotgun by her side. The pain was too much and not too long after she was buried. The man took a rope to the opposite end of the street and hung himself from a tree. So, no matter what side you enter or exit the street, you're greeted by suicide. Through the years since, there have been few bodies discovered in the ravine, both with blunt trauma wounds and some seemingly clean, as if they just dropped dead and rode down the hill to rest. In the middle of the road, about two miles in, is a small cave, which has long been speculated to be a site of some local ritualistic ceremonies, which could be easily dismissed, if not for the occasional blood rag or other ominous items found inside. My story begins in 2010. I was in my junior year of high school, and my mother, a horror buff herself, was looking up spooky places for a creepy road trip she wanted to take. She stumbled upon the Whiskey Hollow Road lore, and that night, my mother, my brother, a cousin, an aunt, and I hopped into the minivan and drove the 15 minutes to the haunted street. I'll admit I scoffed a little, being a too cool for everything punk kid. But as I was intrigued enough to come, and I'll admit, when the van rolled up to that tiny dirt road, my mood changed. I felt an immediate shift in the energy as my mom crept the van into the entrance of the road. And here is where I need to stress just how dark this road is at night. Imagine the darkest place you've ever been and go about 10 times darker than that. There you go. Headlights are barely useful and honestly, you can only see maybe about two feet in front of your vehicle, even with your high beams on. Just before we rolled in, a pickup truck whipped around us and flew down the road. And I mean flew. He had to have been going at least 60 miles an hour on that street. Realistically, going 20 would be risky. I fully expected to see his truck flipped over in the ravine as we entered. The road is pitch black and shockingly quiet. You know when you used to play hide and seek and would hide in the closet or another small space and you could hear your heart beating and your lungs making air for you? Yeah, it was that quiet. 
We shine flashlights through the trees as we pass, and we got our first glimpse of the cave in real life. There's some dark energy in that cave, man. All in all, the drive was not terrifying. We made it to the end of the road, and just as we were about to clear the trees, a burst of light shot across our eyes. We squinted to see the pickup truck sitting at the end of the street, facing us, as if it was waiting to see if we would make it out. We pulled out onto the regular road, and this guy takes off down Whiskey Hollow again. To this day, I don't know how he did it. The next day, my mother was disappointed that nothing super spooky happened and decided we would head out in the daytime to see what the road looked like all lit up. We rolled into the entrance and yes, it was a lot less unsettling. But then again, isn't everything less scary when the lights are on? The silence was still there too, which shocked me a little. Not a bird or an owl. And as I'm writing this, I realized I never once saw an animal in those woods, which for upstate New York is pretty odd. Usually in dense woods, you see a chipmunk or even a garden snake, but nothing. Mom decided to pull up to the cave and we all got out to inspect it in the daylight. It wasn't as deep as we thought it would be, but there were some disturbing items inside a small baby blanket with suspicious stains, and a rattle with some colorful beads inside of it, some alcohol cans, and an old lighter. When I saw the blanket, I felt a knot in my stomach. My mom brushed it off, and we went on with the rest of the day. Flash forward to my senior year of high school. I was hanging out a lot with a cousin who was not only a bad influence, but didn't give half a thought to anything paranormal. I, however, was getting into full baby witch mode this year. I learned how to use a pendulum for communication, candle work, and some light palm reading. So we're hanging with a mutual friend one night, and we're bored. My cousin, let's just call her Mary, says she wants to do something creepy. Our friend, we'll call her Kelly, says she heard about a haunted road somewhere. I butt right in and give them the whole story of Whiskey Hollow, and we're off. The whole ride, we're listening to music and having typical teenage fun. But the minute we approach the cross street, it was like my body could sense the energy again. I was in the back seat and was playing it cool as we pulled into the beginning of the road. But I felt the energy shift hard. It was sunset hour, so we had some light, but I knew our time was limited. We're rolling through, and I reiterate the story again as we pass the trees. Marie is mocking everything and calling bullshit, but Kelly is listening, and as we approach the cave, she excitedly points it out, and we stop the car. We approach the cave. The road is silent as usual and our feet crunching the leaves seem to echo in the vast space. Marie walks straight into the cave, like the horror movie cliche she is, and kicks at the dirt, talking shit, just being your standard non-believing jerk. I told her to chill because if there are any spirits here, she's being disrespectful, which just fuels her fire, and she continues to be a dick. Kelly and I are standing on a large rock, just watching her be an idiot. And as I open my mouth to tell her to stop again, something happens. Without anything touching us, both mine and Kelly's knees buckle, as if someone hit the backs of our legs and we fall into the grass and leaves. We whip around, terrified, and fully expecting to see a deranged mountain man standing there, but there was nothing. Marie laughs at us for falling and we insist that something pushed us as we rub the grime from our jeans. Marie calls bullshit and heads back to the car. As she walks down the hill, Kelly and I try to figure out what the hell just happened and examine the rock, which was completely flat so it's not like gravity took us down or we lost our footing. Oh my god! 
Marie screams from the car. We race toward the vehicle and ask what happened. She fumbles her words, telling us to get in the car now. She says that when she opened the door, a bright white light dashed across the front of the car. It was too solid to be smoke, but not fully shaped to be a figure. I wondered for a split second if she was messing with us, but her face was pale and had no color. Marie never looked like this. She was actually worried. Kelly hopped into the front seat and I slid into the back. Marie started the car and as we pulled away, I couldn't help but give one last look toward the cave and I saw something. There was a figure crouched down on the top of the cave. It looked slender and was completely black, like the Leatherman from American Horror Story, but extremely skinny. I thought it was crazy, and just as it started to stand, Kelly let out a blood-curdling scream from the front seat. Something's on the cave. Marie floored the gas pedal, and we whipped down the street. I was trying to come to terms with the fact that at least two of us saw an entity on that cave, and it couldn't have been an actual person. There was no way. We would have seen someone on top of the cave when we first approached it. This was not a person. It was a thing. Marie shouted her mother's address to the car's GPS system, and it began routing us away from the haunted road. Its navigation voice would chime in, directing Marie's turns as we tried to explain the figure we saw. And then the GPS said, turn right. Marie was so frazzled from her own experience and was avidly listening to ours that she just turned without thinking. And when we looked out the front window again, we were back at the top of Whiskey Hollow Road. The GPS brought us back to the top of the road. We couldn't turn around. We had to drive down Whiskey Hollow again. What is wrong with you? Marie is glaring at me from the front seat. What? I answer. Why are you acting like that? I had no idea what she was talking about. I then looked out the windows and saw that we were parked at a pizza place in Marie's hometown. How did we get here? I thought. Marie then explained to me that the entire ride back, I was silently giving her a death stare through the rearview mirror and wouldn't speak when she talked to me. I would only smirk. And apparently on the highway, I tried to open the back door, fumbling with the lock and handle, but she had the child lock on. I remembered none of it. My point of view we turned around Whiskey Hollow for the second time, and then we were sitting in this parking lot. I thought for years about what that occurrence was all about, and the only thing I can think of is that something noticed me when I first visited with my mother, and when I returned with my cousin and friend, it recognized and latched onto me, and possibly because my cousin was mocking and kicking things, it was going to use me as a vessel to attack her. I refuse to return to that place and wonder if the entity that got inside of me, the entity that stood on top of the cave, was the same thing that drove that couple in the 50s to kill themselves on either side of Whiskey Hollow Road. I find and explore haunted locations and urban legends in Japan. A lot of the places are hyped up in hopes of tourism or a spot of fame on television. And some are a friend of a friend who knew someone experiences, which seem more true depending on how many drinks you've had. Most of the urban legends are similar to Western stories or are more silly than terrifying. Tunnels, on the other hand, almost always have something very unsettling about them. If ever something goes wrong with equipment, a mind-numbing feeling of despair takes a hold of my gut, or something is seen lurking in the distance. It's almost always in a tunnel. 
The creepiest experience I've had is when I was exploring a haunted tunnel in the mountains between Shizuoka and Aichi. I was taking photos of the area and there was something very obviously standing on the other side of the tunnel. It was like two dark masses which would sometimes dart from one side of the entrance wall to the other. Not to be deterred, my friends and I walked into the tunnel with our torches and backpacks. We reached halfway before the torches shut off in some sort of electrical failure. Suddenly, from the other side of the tunnel, which had become very, very dark without a torchlight, I could hear something sprinting towards us. I panicked, turned, and found the rest of my friends had already begun rushing back towards the entrance we had entered from. On the other side, each of us explained what we had seen or heard. I said I heard running footsteps. My other friend said she heard children giggling. Another said he thought he saw something leap in front of his torch beam before it turned off. The final friend said her eye had spotted a white pipe on the wall and thought it was out of place. When she looked again, it had vanished. From a logical perspective, there are plenty of reasons for why the torches turn off. Figuring we had been the subjects of a prank set by local kids, we investigated the tunnel's history a bit further than the first few stories we had scratched up upon the first round of investigating. Turns out, two kids had died in the tunnel during a massive storm. The mother had searched for them during the same storm, but drowned outside the tunnel in flash flooding. Local stories said sometimes the ghosts of the children will rush you in the tunnel, and the mother can be spotted climbing the interior walls of the tunnel, i.e. the white pipe may have been one of her limbs. Ugh, tunnels and their haunted histories. This is something that happened to me when I was a kid, and I just wanted to share my story, since it still sticks with me to this day. I was about seven, eight years old. I can't recall exactly, but it was around that age. One weekend, I was visiting my grandparents, who, at the time, lived on the countryside. I'm from Bosnia, Europe. They were only about an hour's drive away, and we went there early in the morning. Their house is in a wooded area with a long winding road leading up to each individual house, of which there weren't many, perhaps maybe three or four. I knew the area well since I went to visit almost every weekend. Besides going up to the houses, there is one section of the road that leads directly into the woods, sort of a natural trail. Our car broke down exactly around that spot, flat tire. Since we were very close to where my grandparents lived and my folks knew I was familiar with the area, they let me go for a walk while my dad fixed the tire. This was at about 9 to 10 a.m. in the morning, so they weren't really afraid to let me run around a bit. Being the curious kid that I was, and I still am, I went for the forest trail since the main dirt road wasn't very exciting. The trees were very tall and dense, so even during daytime, it was kind of dark. I went up the forest trail for a few hundred meters in until I came to a crossroads. Now, this was more than 20 years ago, but it left a lasting impression on me. So here is what I recall. In the middle of the crossroads, at the very point that the roads fork, there was a cave or opening of some sort. I went a bit closer, and I noticed what seemed like fireflies sparkling in the pitch black hole. I'm not sure if fireflies even light up during the day, but that's how I remember it. Besides that, I just felt this presence, as if I wasn't alone there, as if the cavern was beckoning me to enter. And then I noticed what seemed like several pairs of small red eyes peering from the darkness. At this point, I was quite spooked, thinking it was an animal of some kind, and I decided not to go any further and just slowly back away. 
This is in Southeast Europe, so there aren't many dangerous animals around. Very rarely a wolf or a bear would be sighted, but usually not near human settlement. Nothing followed me, and I had no trouble going back. I decided not to tell my parents about this, since I figured they would be mad and wouldn't let me play unsupervised for the remainder of our visit. They decided to leave me with my grandparents and pick me up on Monday, while they went back during the afternoon. I'm very close with my grandmother. She and I are very alike, especially now as a grown-up. So I told her about the encounter I had. She kind of laughed it off, saying, Honey, there's nothing there. I walk there every day. But I was adamant about what I saw and she agreed we'd go for a walk together and visit that spot. It wasn't far from her house, and we arrived there that same afternoon. We got to the crossroads, and, like she said, there was nothing there. No burrow or cave, just a flat spot where the crossroads met. No traces of it being dug up or buried. Grandma even asked me, Are you sure it was here? And I replied, Yes. She didn't think much of it, chalking it off to childish imagination. But she told me not to venture out here on my own again. We continued our walk, and I just stopped mentioning the event from then on. But to this day, even after all these years, I still remember this quite vividly. I even find it strange I'm able to recall the details. And of course, I know memories can become distorted over time, and that what we think we remember may not always be the full picture since our minds love to fill in the blanks, but I just don't feel as if this is the case. I often contemplate what would have happened had I stepped closer, or worse, tried to enter that dark cave. I've read about evil places and forests around the world, or places where time and space can become warped. People walking into what they describe as different timelines or alternate dimensions. Perhaps this was one of these places. My grandparents don't live there anymore. Grandpa had passed away when I was 16 years old, and my grandma moved to the city in the same building as me and my folks. We still own the house and land there, but I haven't been back since. My dad goes out there a few times a year just to check up on things and clean up a bit. According to him, the house and land have almost been consumed by vegetation. They cut the electricity and water so they wouldn't pay the bills, so it's not very convenient staying over. But I do plan on going there sometime, perhaps during my next time off and vacation from work. I really want to go back to that road assuming it still exists, and just see if I feel anything. Now that I'm an adult with an interest in the paranormal, I'm just so drawn to this memory. Has anyone else experienced something similar? I would love to hear your thoughts. So... I'm an avid caver in West Virginia, and there's this cave not far that's been one of my favorites to explore. It's often my go-to cave to take friends and newcomers to get them into caving, as it's a rather easy, accessible cave and not too challenging of one, although it is a rather large cave system. The first thing to note is there's never any wildlife seen in or near the cave and I've only ever seen very few bats for as large of a cave as it is. Anyway, the first really strange thing to happen was me and my friend stumbling upon a pentagram made of salt with a dead bird in the middle, circled by somewhat seemed to be freshly burnt out candles. Obviously, it was freaky, but we took it to be a prank by some teens or something along those lines. I've always been very comfortable going through this cave and leading treks, but up until now, I had always been with a group of friends. One day, I decided to take my girlfriend through, so just me and her went. 
We didn't make it past the first chamber because I just had such an uneasy feeling and just felt as if I needed to get out of there. My way of describing it is the feeling of being watched, but on steroids. I've been in some sketchy places, but I've never had that sense of dread in all of my life. The next thing to happen is when a group of us friends went and stumbled upon a newer looking jacket far back in the cave that was never there before. I wouldn't have taken it to be so odd, but it seemed to be a rather expensive jacket with no apparent damage or reason to just leave it laying randomly in this far back portion of the cave. There was also nobody else around at this time. The next thing to happen was when a group of us friends were exploring and on the way back out, one of the most serious friends just seemed really strange and off. Finally, I asked him if he was good and he nodded and quickly told me to just keep moving. Once we got out of the cave, he pulled me in private, which is really not like him, but he told me he didn't think it was a good idea to go back in there. I finally convinced him to tell me why, and he told me that he swore he saw a person back there. From what he could see, a very pale, lanky person. He couldn't quite make it out at first, but he said he noticed it following us. He even tried calling out a few times, but we didn't think nothing of it, doing it at the same time as it's fun to yell and make echoes. Anyways, after this experience, I convinced the same friend to go back with me along with our other buddy to reach an extremely difficult place that I haven't been able to get to yet, seeing as I've been taking newbies. As we arrive at the cave, there was a man and woman camping nearby who were standing at the entrance. We made friendly convo and asked if they were going inside. They said no, they were just checking it out. So we then continued on. After reaching our goal and being at the dead end of a very tight spot, we laid and rested for a while. Then we heard people. We all heard it at the same time as we looked at each other and squinted. We couldn't quite make out what they were saying as it was very distant and echoed and muffled, but we could clearly make out that it was English, male and female voices, and we heard laughter and water splashing. We thought it was pretty odd because it was in the AM and we didn't expect anyone else around aside from those two campers, so we figured it was them. Anyways, as we were exhausted, we rested for a good while longer and shut our lights off to save our batteries. We remained quiet as we were just resting, and after a while, we couldn't hear anymore. Then we went ahead and made our way back out of the cave, and as we exited, the man and woman was still there by the entrance. My friend asked, So you decided to go in after all? The man replied, Um, no, why? And we just asked if anyone else had been in or out, and they said they hadn't seen nobody at all the entire time. At this point, we were creeped out, as we all clearly heard voices, but we didn't really talk about it much amongst each other. Much later, while doing research, I started putting things together in my head and realized my friend's description as being very Wendigo-esque, and then I recalled how Wendigos are known for being able to imitate human voices to lure their prey, and it just really creeped me out. I almost wouldn't believe what he said he saw, but if you understood the person I'm talking about, he's not someone to ever just make something up like that. Anyways, I hope you found my story interesting, and I apologize if it was too long, but I hope to hear some of your feedback. Have you ever ran into such a creature in a cave? Also, I'm not really sure where the witchcraft would tie in, but... It's definitely worth mentioning that I later talked to another caver friend of mine who, before I could even mention, told me that he had found a pentagram similar to the one I found in the exact same cave at a different time. I 
I worked in a salt mine under Lake Erie a couple years ago, and generally speaking, when things are brought down, they're never brought back up. It takes a lot of time to disassemble everything up top, secure and cover the parts, and put it back together down below, and vice versa. So there's tons of old trucks, tractors, and countless other things lined up in the far side of the mine. Anyway, in the 80s, U of Michigan and Cal Irvine were studying proton decay and trying to capture measurements when it actually happened. Conducting this experiment topside is problematic because of cosmic rays and other forms of interference. So the mine was chosen as 2,000 feet of Earth absorbed pretty much everything. So they dug out a pool about 80 feet by 70 feet, filled it with 2,640,000 gallons of purified water, and put fancy cameras and other equipment along the side. They had a whole shop, lab, and dive center down there. I don't think they ever captured a proton to gain, and eventually the grant money ran out after a few years, so the mine threw up some caution tape on the main steel door leading to the study, and that was that. Fast forward 20 years, and I'm working there as an electrician, and I get a job to fix some big conveyor motor drive. So I set off and try to cannibalize some parts off old equipment. I remember one of the old timers telling me there's a bunch of abandoned equipment in an area by the Kepi lift, the main elevator. I get over there and find a big steel door falling off of its hinges with some very old caution tape laying on the ground. The whole study had to be accessed through this one door, which was dug into the wall. So after a while, the earth slowly crushes, bends, and pushes the ground up. After several tries, I yank the door open and step inside, only to shit myself and fall back when I see a full scuba outfit, wetsuit, mask, belt, gloves, hanging three feet inside. So I collect myself, find that I didn't actually shit myself, how I'll never know, and go inside past the goddamn scuba dude. Everything inside was left exactly how it was left 20 years ago. Coffee cups left out, day planners, job schedules, along with tons of scuba gear, oxygen fill tanks, and computers. I make it about 10-ish feet to the edge of the pool, and it's hard to see if the water's still in it because there's no wind to move it. But eventually, I see it is still there, 60 plus feet of pure water in an absolutely dark pool. The sight of a huge black pool in a huge black hole in the ground lit only by the small amount of light my cap lamp put out, and the absolute silence of being underground made me really uncomfortable. So, I left in a hurry. That's my story. It's not particularly scary, but all that stuff sitting down there nearly perfectly preserved in such an unexpected place was always just creepy as hell to me. I have never told anyone this story, and this is one I've been holding back on with most people for some time. So, in December 2017, a few days before Christmas, my best buddy and me decided to go to a West Virginia town about 90 minutes away from where we lived. We found a way to a popular trail in our state, and we wound up hiking for 25 miles on hold, crossing through two counties, well, along the way, we encountered a number of long, abandoned tunnels that had been used for the railroad back in the day. One of these tunnels was especially long and dark, and as we moved through the blackness, I couldn't help but feel like I was being watched by something or someone. I keep wishing to myself that we make it out of this tunnel soon, and eventually we do. Well, for some reason, I'm compelled to look back at the tunnel 
and I saw something that caused me to freeze up where I stood. In the darkness, I could see the figure of a woman standing there. She had dark hair, and she wore a white dress that looked as if it was from the 1800s. Her face was as pale as death, and she was looking right at me. I started freaking out and pointed her out to my friend. But by the time I did, she was gone, vanished without a trace. This guy's a good buddy of mine, and we've both had our scare of weird experiences. But that's for another time. I guess the reason I'm telling you this one is because afterwards, I came to discover that the particular tunnel systems we were using on our journey were noted by folks as being haunted. The chief ghost? A woman in white. They call her the White Woman of Silver Run Tunnel. Well, apparently, in the summer of 1865, the Silver Run Tunnel endured a rock collapse, which killed three men and seriously injured a lone woman. Her fate was not disclosed. In the 1940s, a woman's skeleton with long dark hair and a white dress was discovered to be in the walls of an abandoned house near the tunnels. Reportedly, for a period after the discovery of the body, the sightings of this mysterious white woman in the tunnels stopped. These are the only instances of a traumatic experience involving a woman and the Silver Run Tunnel I could find, and I would assume at least one of them would be correct. It was so bizarre, but it's definitely something I'm going to carry with me for the rest of my days. I live in South Spain, near some really ancient forests called Los Aconores, which had some kind of trees that are almost extinct and only grow here and in another two or so places. It's a bit of a rocky terrain, and if you are ever walking in the forest and try to climb some rocks, you should be really careful because usually you can have caves and hollow spaces under your feet and you can fall easily. So. My father and his friends usually go hiking on Thursdays, so they don't find anyone in the woods, besides maybe a shepherd or a forest worker. And on this day, they decided to climb a really large and rocky hill. My uncle Frank remembered that when he was young, he slept on a little cave when he went hunting and got lost, and he wanted to try to find that cave. After a few hours, they find the cave. It was covered in moss and grime, but it was surely the same cave. One of my father's friend, John, tried to get as far as possible into the cave because he was in really good shape and wanted to see all of it. The rest of them waited outside. Suddenly, John started screaming and calling for my father. He went inside and turned on his torch. Inside of the cave was a really weird shrine or something like that, with candles, two apples, bones, pieces of coal and ashes on the ground, a pair of gloves, a pot and pan, etc. Everything looked really old and dusty, and it was clear it hasn't been touched in a long time. My father went to the shrine, and it had a little bowl, and when he looked inside, there was something that looked like human teeth. When they got out, they packed all of their things and got out of there as fast as they could. My father refuses to hike around there anymore, and they started hiking on the other side of the hill and into the woods. All of this was really strange, and I've never heard of something like this before. I don't know anything about voodoo or this kind of things, but my father said it looked like some voodoo shrine or some stuff like that. If any of you know something like this, or maybe ran across something like this, I would truly appreciate your thoughts, concerns, or explanations. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, terrifying cave stories. I'd like to take a moment and give a special shout out to the reformed members 
of Back to Ashes. Mrs. Innerscare, Tina Mee, Colt Stone Wolf, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norman D.W., Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's Niece. Thank you for your continued support of Back to Ashes. It really does mean the world to me. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.